When the Sabbath was over, the women brought spices to anoint Jesus' dead body. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, they came to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. And the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. We know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Church, would you stand and sing?
risen. He is risen indeed. Now, brothers and sisters, turn to one another and pass the peace in the joy of this Resurrection Sunday.
Amen, church. You may be seated. Let's continue celebrating the joy of the resurrection. Would you turn your attention to the screens and let's join those in the atrium for holy baptism. Well, church, today we celebrate with God as Penny and Micah and Eli and Dacia and Jamari become united with God's son, Jesus Christ, through the sacrament of baptism. Today, your Adam identity will die and you'll be raised into a new life, the humanity of Jesus Christ, receiving the fullness of God's grace so that you may faithfully bear his image for the rest of your life. From this point on, your identity will be bound to God and to his church. When you rejoice, we will rejoice. When you mourn, we will mourn. And together with all those baptized before you, you'll be expected to live a life worthy of the family name of Jesus Christ. You'll be expected to continue in the apostles' teaching, in the fellowship of Christ's church, breaking bread at his table, and prayer. You'll be expected to resist evil, and whenever you do fall into sin, to repent and to return to the Lord. You'll be expected to proclaim the good news by your words and by your example and to love all people as you love yourself, striving for God's justice and peace among all, respecting the dignity of every person. To help you do this, God will give you his spirit who will guide you into all truth. This is the baptismal life. So church, as a way to commit to this life and affirm that there is one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, let us as one church proclaim our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you believe all this, say, yes, I believe it. Okay, we can keep going. Thanks be to God. Church, uh, as the baptizans come out of the water today, you'll hear me introduce them as sister or brother. And as our family grows, we together must commit ourselves to our new brothers and sisters. There may be times in their future when they are wounded or empty or wandering or even lost. Do you commit to pursue them, to diligently nourish them with goodness and faithful love, to guide them to the right path by the example of your own life, and to intentionally protect and comfort them. If so, say, with God's help, we will. Thanks be to God. God, you used water and spirit to bring forth the first creation, to cleanse your creation in the flood, to deliver your people from the Egyptians, to heal Naaman in the Jordan and in that same river to bring forth the second creation in the humanity of Jesus Christ. So today, make this water your water. Sanctify it so that in the same way it can cleanse and deliver and heal and recreate these, your beloved, as they continue to live in the everlasting life of your son. The evil one has no claim on them. They're your children and they bring you great joy. With this water, cultivate the soil of their life so that they can only produce the fruit of your spirit. Use their life as a channel of your kingdom, making what is often unseen, seen through the ways that they live from this point on. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen.
First today we have uh, Penny Myers, who's joined by her mom, Kelly. Penny, I'd invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. I've chosen to become baptized because I want to answer God's call and become a fully formed disciple of Christ. I want to never doubt the Lord and have him guide me. I want to be like Peter when he walked on water. He was obedient and trusting in the Lord, which kept him from sinking. Only when his confidence in Jesus faltered did he start to fall, and yet Jesus still saved him from drowning. I want baptism to be my step of faith to show that I will walk on the water and never fall because my confidence and trust in the Lord keeps me afloat. And even if I do doubt or question the Lord, he will save me from sinking and lead me back to him. Mm, there's the sermon. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Penelope June, would we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? You're now dead to sin. I'm alive in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Sister Penny. Now we have Michael Wilkinson, and because his dad Aaron is in the ordination process for the Westing Church, he's going to be participating in baptizing his sons today. So, Mike, I invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. I believe that my relationship with God is strong and that God loves me. Through baptism, God cleans my spirit. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went to against a king that did not believe in God. The king punished them by throwing them into a fire. When he pulled them out, not even their clothes were burned. So like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I want to follow God no matter what. Micah, Aaron, Allen, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Now we have another Wilkinson, Eli. Eli, I invite you also to testify to God's grace in your life. I want to get baptized because I feel incomplete without it. I have seen the fruit of God in my mom's love, my brother Micah's joy, and my dad's kindness and faithfulness. I think baptism is the next step in my relationship with God because I believe it is a way for God to make me more like him. Amen. Right. Eli, Xavier, Delane, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are dead to sin. And alive in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Brother Eli. Now we have Daisha Broomsfield, accompanied by her mentor and friend, Cindy Pattendale. All of our mentor and friends, Cindy Pattendale. <laughs> Sure. That's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Dacia, go ahead and testify to God's grace in your life. I'm trying. It's okay. You got this. Sorry. <laughs> I grew up going to church with my grandma every Saturday faithfully. In 2020, my three-week-old daughter, Legacy Dills, passed away unexpectedly. <laughs> and I started spiraling very fast. After that, I didn't make the best choices for two and a half years. I eventually got tired of the choices I was making, as in going to jail and not seeing my children, Legend Ozaro. November 27th, I stopped doing drugs. On February 1st, I started drug court and God started working on my heart. I reached out to Miss Cindy and we went to church on February 19th and prayed and asked Christ into my life. And now I'm ready to have a spirit-filled life. 
Amen. Amen. Shigail, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are now dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Sister Nation. joined by Jamari Reed and his friend and mentor Daniel Wright. You can go ahead and testify to God's grace in your life. God has used many people in this church and also others throughout my entire life to bring me closer to him. Some of these few people are Daniel, Jordan, Ryan, Elizabeth, Joel, Jeff, Amy, Vicky, and many other great mentors within and out of the church. Throughout them and the love that is shown in JCB, I continue to build my relationship with Christ. I also want to thank Him for the relationships and friendship that I have. I thank God for putting these people in my life and also leading me to the amazing camps I've gone to with the church that has really shown me His love and gave me a knowledge of how great our God is. Even in the ups and downs, I realize that God is always with me and He will always be with me. He will be the light in any darkness. He is the one who knows all of my struggles. And He is the one that is working through me as I become a better man and more like Jesus. Whenever I was going through a rough time in my life, God was always there for me. Through the thick and thin, He will always be there. God uses this water to destroy life, destroy death, to bring life, destroy death, and give us a path to freedom, to heal us, and also to give us an identity. I am so thankful that God has led me in my life in the way He will continue to lead me as I keep growing and growing as the days go on and pursue me to live in the glory of His holy name. Amen. Amen. you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are now dead to sin. I want to get baptized so I can be closer to God and learn more about Him. My parents brought me to this church since I was little. They taught me how to be a follower of God and be a good person. My grandparents taught me how to be a nice person and to be nice to others. A passage that I like is Romans 6:11. It says, "Consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive in Christ." To me, this means that being baptized is showing that I believe in him. I will be closer to him and get to be forgiven by him. So one day I can go to heaven and see Jesus. I want to get baptized to be forgiven to go to heaven, and most of all, to be closer to God. Thanks be to God. Hadley Mills, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are now dead to sin, and alive in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Sister Hadley. will be joined by Drayson Ott, who's accompanied by his father, Ryan. Drayson, you can go ahead and testify to God's grace in your life. My name is Drayson Ott, and I love Jesus Christ. My favorite Bible verse is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. <laughs> okay. I like... I like this verse because it tells me that if I believe in God, I will live forever in heaven with Him. Sunday school, my grandparents and parents all help me learn about God and help me want to follow Him. I'm getting baptized today because I want people to know that I am a child of God, especially my friends. Thanks be to God. Trace and Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are now dead to sin. And in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Brother Grace. Amen. Let's pray, church. Oh, Lord, risen, 
alive and full of grace. Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for what you have done in our place, God. We rejoice in this day of resurrection and we celebrate your love and your amazing grace that saved a wretched people like us. And we thank you, God, that for the freedom that you have given us and what all that this day means to each and every one of us. Lord, we resonate with the psalmist that says, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And this morning, God, we give thanks for this past week and this holy week, Lord, as we have been together in many aspects. We have watched the children waving the palm branches and leading us into the, the triumphal entry. And each night meeting for Vespers and on Friday meeting together for Good Friday service and then together celebrating the passport to Jerusalem where over 500 people in our community experienced what you experienced on the road to the cross and to the empty tomb. God, thank you for the volunteers. It takes a lot of people to make something like that happen. And we have over 90 volunteers. God, thank you for those who have made this week so special. And it's even continuing today, Lord, as we give thanks to you for our sister Hadley and our brother Drayson, who declared publicly their love and their passion for you through the waters of baptism. God, we ask that you would follow them all the days of their lives, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and knowledge as they continue and yearn to be more like you. And Father, as we think of our brothers and sisters in this, in this church, Lord, I, I want to remember the family of Ruth Smith and her passing, and for those who are grieving. We think of Patrick Eby this past week who has had a, a bike accident. God, we thank you for your watch and your care over him. We ask that you would continue to heal his body from that accident. And Lord, I pray that you be with Brenda Woods this past week as her father, Paul Bardsley, has experienced a stroke and God, she's asking for just wisdom and to know what to do in those next days. Oh, God, would you guide him in that? Oh, Father, how we love you. And this day, Lord, we just continue in that celebration. And right now, Lord, would you prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now hear the word of the Lord from the book of Exodus and 1 Peter. Then the Lord told Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave masters. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with a great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. 
I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure trial for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purified gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you receive the joy and glorious inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Boy, I'm blessed, aren't you? Man, what a morning. Oh, my goodness. I think we should just go home. My word. The whole week has been amazing. There's been vespers each night. It's been short, but it's been highly liturgical. People have brought their own stories into it, and God has met us there. Good Friday was powerful with the imagery along with the liturgy. Yesterday was... Um, Passport to Jerusalem, you heard that over 500 kids, almost 100 volunteers. Uh, it, and this morning, when I got here this morning, this was amazing. I just thought, man, I've told somebody this week as a preacher, every Easter is intimidating because you come up to what is arguably the greatest event in the history of the world, and you don't have a vocabulary big enough for that moment. It's a little like standing in front of the Grand Canyon and just going, wow, what else do you say? You don't have language for this. So maybe we'll just start with the text. Is that all right? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who are right now being preserved by faith for the day of redemption that is just ahead of you yet to come. You are people of the resurrection. You are people of the resurrection. I know a lot has happened to you in the last week or maybe the last month. And I know there's been times in the night, mornings, when you have doubted that. I know some of you doubt even your own salvation. But God is greater than your doubts. He is calling you this morning into something that is much bigger than you. He is calling you into resurrection. Can I tell the story? I, I will be fast. Uh, on the first Easter, two men are leaving church. I mean for good, because God has abandoned them disappointed them. Religion has failed. It has failed to protect them. It's failed to help them. It's failed even to explain why all of this is happening. They look around them and they see nothing but crime and violence and the corruption of power. And there is no explanation for this. And so they are leaving Jerusalem and they are headed back to their town seven miles away in Emmaus. And partway through that conversation, 
They are joined by a stranger, and no one knows how he got there. But suddenly he appeared, and they stopped and turned. And he says, what are you talking about as you walk along the way? And they said, you must not... You must be the only one in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these last few days. He says, what things? They say, Jesus, the man from God who is powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, He preached powerful messages. He touched people who were untouchable. He fed the multitudes. He ate with sinners. He walked on water. And our leaders handed him over to be crucified. We thought he was the one. He was the one who was going to finish this march. And this morning, to make matters worse, our women have come over to us and said that they went to the tomb and they found the tomb was empty. They said an angel told them that he had risen from the dead. Now we don't know what to believe. Do we believe what we were told or do we believe what we have seen? Because we went to the tomb and the tomb was empty, but him we did not see. So we don't know what to believe. Do we still have hope or not? And about this time, the stranger starts to smile, I think. He says, you really don't get it, do you? And beginning with the prophets, he said, did not the Christ have to suffer these things before going into his glory? Did you think the suffering Was a detour? Did you think the suffering meant something went wrong? No, the suffering is how he became king. He needed the suffering to become king. And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he started explaining to them these things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Let me stop there. Is there ever a conversation you wish you could be part of? I mean, I know some of you know the Old Testament really well, and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure. I think, no, no, you would be surprised too. Would you not like to just tag along behind those other two and listen to him explain the scriptures? It's like, oh, I missed that. I missed that. I'm imagining that conversation. I'm imagining it went something like this. What's happening this morning on Easter, says the stranger, is an exodus. And they say, what are you talking about? The stranger said, this is another exodus. The exodus isn't something that just happened a few thousand years ago. The exodus is still happening. It's happening again and again. And the last exodus happened just a few moments ago. And you are in it. And they say, what on earth are you talking about? He says the exodus is really the only thing that ever happens in Scripture. All other stories, including the last few days, just sit on top of the exodus and the exodus carries them along. The people of God are defined by exodus. The people of God are always in an exodus. The people of God are still in an exodus. Do you get it? They said... Yes. (laughs) Every exodus, he says, has four movements. It starts with a cry. It's followed by a deliverer who is followed by an act of God, a eucatastrophe. 
And that's when the march begins. These things, says the stranger, the cry, the deliverer, the miracle, and the march are in every single exodus. And it has not happened just once. It's happened multiple times, and it's happening this morning. The cry is a deep-seated ache, a longing, a suffering that is born in the soul. It's not a complaint. You complain when you want something to change. You cry when you think it won't. Cry is rooted in despair and it's born of resistance. It refuses to accept things as they are, but it is powerless to do anything about them. Somehow when the people of God cry, that cry, even when it is not aimed at God, always makes its way into the heavens. And there is nothing that moves the Father like a cry. And that's when he sends a deliverer, someone who identifies with the people. He is empowered by God and called by God, but he's not a superhero. In fact, he is often persecuted, overwhelmed by the very people he has come to save. You might almost say he comes unto his own and his own receive him not. So God authenticates every deliverer with a mighty act. It's a eucatastrophe. It's a sudden and a joyous turn in the story. It could never happen twice, but once is enough because it is so powerful that that it casts the light over the rest of history. And after the miracle, the march has begun. And in every march, God frees us and redeems us and he claims us as his own and he leads us into the land. And Exodus, says the stranger, is never an escape it's a getting out to go in. In the first exodus, the cry came from the slaves. Pharaoh had changed the politics and harnessed them into work camps and made them into slaves and worked them ruthlessly. The other cry was from an infant born to a Levite woman who refused to kill him, as Pharaoh said, but instead she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and placed him in a basket and floated him on the Nile. The Pharaoh's own daughter heard the cry went over and fetched the child, pulled him out of the water, took him home to daddy's house. Gave him a name, Moses, which means drawn from the water. Fed him and raised him on the Pharaoh's own dime. The deliverer has appeared. Anyone reading the story can hear the footprints of the people of God are starting to get restless. They're ready to form a march. Forty years later, this child goes into Pharaoh's house and says, this is what Yahweh says, Israel is my son, my firstborn son, and I've told you to let my son go so he may worship me in the desert, but you refuse to let my son go. So the Yahweh says, you have taken my son, I will come and get yours. Pharaoh is not impressed. He laughs and says, who is this Yahweh? And he doubles down. So the deliverer raises his hand over the Nile and he turns it into blood and then he raises it over the land and in come the frogs and the gnats and the flies and the hail and the locusts. He even stops the sun from shining. It is dark in the middle of the day. He 
He has one by one destroyed the gods of the empire. And on the night before they leave, the Israelites take a lamb and they sacrifice it, each one of them, not one, thousands, in their homes. And they put the blood on the doorposts of the house. Because that night, Yahweh Himself will go through the land and He will keep His promise. He will kill the firstborn of every Egyptian from the prisons to the palace itself, even the livestock. The eldest dies. Pharaoh hears the wailing of his people in Egypt. Yahweh has kept his promise with a mighty, powerful act that can only happen once. And the march begins. They gather as a multitude at the edge of the sea. Once there, Moses spreads his staff over the waters and waits for God to move. And as always is the case, nothing happens at first. The people start to grumble. Why didn't you leave us back in prison? That was a better life, they said. But while they're grumbling, Moses feels a gentle breeze coming from the east. He knows with the feeling of the breeze that something is up. Within minutes, the breeze has become a near gale, then a strong gale, then a storm. And instead of blowing the waves on to the people, it starts to move the waves apart. And the people of God go walking into that sea on dry ground. This watery grave becomes a highway. And they walk through it. Not in it. And come out the other side. Now God has freed his people. He will go about the hard task of redeeming them. And people, this can take years. He must teach them trust instead of self-reliance. Rest instead of anxiety. Abundance instead of scarcity. Compassion instead of inhumanity. Solidarity instead of independence. Friendship with God instead of alienation. You don't learn these things in a moment. They take a lifetime, but praise God, you can learn them. The people of God go through the wilderness 40 years and they enter the promised land it's not what they thought because it never materializes rather than drive the Canaanites out they intermarry them they start adopting their practices they start worshiping their gods they take on their values they start thinking like the Canaanites they are not a distinct people at all they start setting up shrines and the shrines become idols. And then they get envious of other nations and they demand that they have their own king. And the first king they have is like Pharaoh. He's building monuments for himself. He's forcing people into labor camps. He's not serving, he's being served. Pharaoh is replaced by David. David is replaced by Solomon. And Solomon builds the temple and the people think to themselves, we have finally arrived. The dwelling of God is finally with men. But the problem is Solomon soon after marries, wait for it, Pharaoh's daughter. He's back. 
He uses forced labor to complete his building projects. He gets horses, chariots, and gold from Egypt. The land is polluted again, in need of another exodus. The nation divides. Ten of the tribes go north and start setting up shrines, priesthood for idols. The prophets are persecuted. The righteous are oppressed. The economy collapses in the south. They're engaged in battle after battle after battle until Egypt, it's back, comes and plunders the temple. We're in need of another exodus. This time the cry is heard from the poor, the oppressed, the immigrant, the undocumented. And it reaches Yahweh's ears. And a man by the name of Elijah comes walking into the palace of Ahab with the news. There will be neither dew nor rain on the land for several years until I give the command. The king, like Pharaoh, laughs. No one can do this, he says, until it happens. Now, two, three years into the famine, no one is eating. The heavens are dry. He goes looking for the prophet. Why have you done this, he says to the prophet. Why have you brought these things onto the land? The prophet says, I did not bring these things. You did. You abandoned the laws of Yahweh. You've turned from the God of heaven to the gods of Baal. And that's why we have what we have so says the prophet I declare a contest let there be on this day a contest you bring the prophets together and I will call on Yahweh and whoever brings down fire from heaven he is the God everyone agrees they should never have done that the prophets get busy building altars. They've set all of the wood from six in the morning to noon. They start calling out for the gods of Baal to come and light fire to the altar. Nothing happens. At noon, they panic. They start screaming and cutting themselves. Elijah starts taunting them. Where are your gods, he says. Maybe they're busy. Maybe they're asleep. Maybe they're just lost in deep thoughts. And finally, when the prophets have failed... And the gods of Israel have failed again. The prophet Elijah steps forward and calls to the God of heaven. Bam! Fire from heaven comes down. It consumes the altar, drinks up the water, takes the sacrifice and kills the priests standing around it. He turns to the king and says, you better get something to eat. Elijah backs up, puts his knees between his legs, gives order to the king. I feel a wind. I feel a breeze coming from behind me. You better hitch up your chariots or you're going to get caught in the rain. The king can't believe it, but he knows better than not to. Seven times the prophet looks to the sea and sees nothing until the last time he sees a cloud in the sky the size of a man's fist. And when he sees it, he says, I think it's fixing to rain. And in a mighty act of God that can only be happen once, God opens the sky at His command and brings rain. And the march begins. Do you hear a pattern, church? Do you see a pattern? 
We are always caught in a deep cry, a longing for something more. We are always searching for a deliverer, usually these days from the political realm, never from the heavens. We are waiting for a miraculous act of God that can only happen once. And the people of God are always ready and restless to move. Israel spirals again into apostasy. They worship other gods. The prophets arise to warn them. Hosea is the first. He tells them that God is going to lead his people back to Egypt like he did the first time, that they will eat the food of the Assyrians. But, says the prophet, just as God will take us back to Egypt, he will lead us out. And we will know that Yahweh is our Savior. I hear the sound of bondage followed by an exodus. Isaiah picks up the story and says God is going to carve another road through the desert like He did through the sea. God is going to turn dry desert into springs and rivers. God is going to change the heart of a person. It won't be the Pharaoh from without. It won't be the Pharaoh of our kings and our leaders. It will be the Pharaoh inside every one of us that God will break His power. The disciples on the road by this time are restless. They're like you. They're waiting for this deliverer to arise. Isaiah says God will roll up His sleeve and bear His holy arm. And we can hardly wait until at the end of the book He shows up. And He is nothing like what we thought. He's a loser. He's despised, rejected. He's not forgiving sins. He's carrying them. Ours. The Old Testament goes out with a whimper, not a roar. It's not until we get in to the New Testament where we start to see it come together. Jesus says, there was one born from among you who, like Moses, fled to Egypt to get away from a tyrant king, who, like Moses, wandered in the wilderness 40 days not years, who like Moses was drawn up out of the water, who like Moses was tempted in the wilderness with the very things the Israelites were tempted with. The grumbling for food, the demanding of a miracle, the bowing down to foreign gods, the claiming of an inheritance before its time. And he overcame all of them. By now, Jesus has reached the house in Emmaus. He acts like he's ready to go on. And the, the two travelers on the road ask him if he'll stay. He does. And he finishes the story. This character, says Jesus, he is the firstborn that Pharaoh had hostage. He is the lamb that was slain on Passover night. He is the breeze that Moses felt behind him at the sea. He is the manna in the desert. He is water from a rock. He is the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. This is him, he says. By now, they're starting to wake up. 
He says, God has never abandoned his people. Wrong was always active, but it was never on the throne. It was always God leading his people out of bondage. He is the prophet. He is the servant of the Lord. He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the living exodus. This means, says Jesus, as he sits down at the table, that the march has begun. Your servant has taken your sins upon him. He has walked into the sea and then threw it again, and he has drowned your sins, separating you from them forever. And he is in the process right now, says the stranger, of redeeming you, of teaching you how to trust instead of self-reliance, rest instead of anxiety, abundance instead of scarcity, compassion instead of inhumanity, solidarity instead of independence, friendship with God instead of alienation from God. It's happening to you now, says the stranger to the two men. It's happening now. It's, a, it's an exodus. The march has begun. Get in it. You're on it. This means that everything that you're involved in for the kingdom of God matters. You're not making gardens that will one day be plowed under. You're not making art that will one day be thrown into the fire. You're not oiling some machine that will one day roll over the cliff. Every act of mercy, every art in Jesus' name, every time you teach a handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of kindness you give to the least of these is being brought into the new world that God is creating. It has already begun. You are people of resurrection. This is your story. Someone hands him the bread. And when he breaks it, their eyes are opened. And instantly, he vanishes from their sight. He didn't go away. That's not what that means. That word vanishes means literally he became invisible. He never left. He never left. He was still there, but he became invisible. Jesus is present even when we think he is not. He's present now. If you've come to help us serve communion, would you please come and help us serve communion? We're going to reenact that meal that the disciples had with Jesus at that table. Church, I want to say when they got up and ran back to Jerusalem, it was not just the breaking of the bread. It was the story that their eyes were opened. Did not our hearts burn within us when he 
talked with us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. But it was not just the story, it was the breaking of the bread. And when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened. It's only when we hear the story and see ourselves in the exodus that God has started, the last exodus, that the breaking of the bread means what it means. There that night, before turning in, Jesus took bread and he broke it, blessed it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. We don't know we might imagine he took a cup and said this cup is the blood of a new covenant better than the one from Moses this cup will not only keep you from sin it will keep sin out of you and that has been the problem all along. This is the last exodus. Father, this morning we have heard the story, retold it with a vocabulary too small. Our thoughts have been in all different places our emotions from high to low. And yet there is no moment in the morning more sacred and holy than this. Before me are people, some who are in bondage, some struggling with the old ways of Egypt, some alone, not really belonging to anyone and some just tired and they want to go in and this morning as the bread is shared and as the cup is shared i pray that your people would find deliverance and redemption and belonging and home bring us home in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. search the world but it couldn't fill me and man's empty praise and treasures the fame I never enough then you came along and you put me back together Is now satisfied right here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, no, nothing is better.
shall be forevermore. Yes, yes, holy is the Lord. Come on, church. Christ is with us in this place. Christ goes with us into the world. So go in his peace. He is risen. He is risen 
Amen.